So today's session is JCL, job control language. Um, some people think JCL is difficult, and I can tell you it's not. It's actually very, very, very easy. Sometimes it can look difficult because you don't, may not understand the, the basics. So what I plan to do is show you the basics and how sometimes it can look more complicated than it really is. But JCL is actually a very clever mechanism. And I'm going to explain why it was so clever when it was put together. Okay, so after, uh, this, uh, after this unit, I want you to be able to understand the purpose of JCL. I want you to understand what a job statement is, what an execute statement is, and what a DD statement is, and what they're all about. I want you to understand the relationship of a program file name to what is referred to as a JCL DD name, which is really one of the fundamental important reasons for JCL. Then I want you to be able to locate the JCL professional manuals, documentation, and online help. So JCL, Job Control Language, it's computer code that tells the operating system what to do. And I will admit that when I first learned JCL many, many years ago, the word language is a little bit of a misnomer. Is it really a computer language, like a programming language? No, I don't think so. I think of, uh, it, it, it's more like job control syntax or job control commands or statements. But it's known as job control language. But don't think of it as like a programming language. It's a series of statements. Just think of it as a series of statements. That, and JCL tells the computer what program to execute. So when JCL enters the system, you say, okay, here's the program I want. And JCL is a mechanism, so the program, it, when, it, when the program wants to read things or write the things, JCL provides the ability for that program to read and write to different physical devices. And I'm going to explain why I said physical, because inside the program, it's logical. And so this was a level of virtualization that they put together over 50 years ago. So here's a diagram, JCL, think of it as a, uh, as a number of statements. They used to be on Hollerith cards, the old punch cards, and that's what the symbol is. And all it is now is a series of statements in a data set. And so when the JCL goes into the system, typically JES reads that JCL. You'll notice here the JCL gets submitted. And then what it does is the JCL requests a program. And the program is on disk somewhere. And so the program gets brought in. The program is loaded. And then, number four, JCL allocates resources needed by the program. So what it will do is it will go to disk and say, oh, I need a data set on this particular disk. And then, number five, the resources are provided to the program that's loaded, then the program, number six, can actually write to something called a JEV spool, because JEV spool, we'll talk about that later, it collects the output, but of course the, it can write to, to disk also, disk data sets, not just the JEV spool. And then a common thing that might happen is after the, um, it's collected in the JEV spool, it may be told to automatically go to a printer, a physical printer. And so this is the concept of what's going on with JCL. It enters the system, gets the program, it allocates resources such as data sets, and it can write output. The other thing that you can do, this is very high level, if you write things into the spool, you can actually use SDSF to actually look in the JEV spool at the output. If it happens to be on data set, we can also use TSO to look at data sets. But in this case, let's say it wrote it to the JES pool. Well, we can use SDSF panels to view the JES pool output. 
And then number two, the Jeff Spool output, once we view it, we can go look at it and it gets displayed on your terminal. We'll be doing that. And we'll talk more about this Jeff Spool later and what it is. Now, if we wrote, if we use JCL to write to data sets, and also you can use JCL to write to Unix files, once we've written to a data set or Unix files, of course, you can use in this case, we're showing one and two. You can use TSO ISPF panels to view the program output on disk, and it will display the data back to the terminal. And once again, this is true for MVS data sets and Unix files that I'll be talking about a little, I think in the next session, we'll talk about data sets. And, and then we'll be talking about Unix files. So JCL, uh, to repeat some of the things, uh, ZOS, a ZOS written application program can include internal file names. So inside the program, you just give it a file name, some eight-character thing, which is opened for reading or writing during execution. So the program has the hard-coded file names inside of it. Well, what JCL does, JCL associates the internal program file name with a physical resource such as data sets or Unix file names or data sets on tape. So JCL is used to process the program in the background called batch and process the program. And oh yeah, and what I want to say here is when you process programs in the foreground, that's known as a started task. So JCL is used for background processing. JCL is also involved with doing a start of something that's a foreground task. So you can submit JCL. When you submit it, it results in batch processing in the background. When you start something, it results in foreground processing. We have a diagram coming up very uh, close, uh, very soon, where I, sh I want to show you the relationship between the file name and the JCL DD name. So I'm repeating a couple things here. JCL instructs ZOS as a result of doing a submit or a start. Submit is background, start is foreground. JCL is easily identified by a slash slash in column one and two. JCL is uppercase unless the text is enclosed in quote marks. It used to be it was always uppercase all the time. But as soon as we put a positive compliant Unix there, Unix file names are, can be mixed case and they're case sensitive. So in JCL, we can actually enclose Unix file names in quotes and it will take it as an absolute name. And I'll show you examples of that later. Every batch, every batch JCL job must contain a job statement. Job basically identifies the name of the thing that's going to be executing in the background. Then the execute statement says, what program do you expect me to execute? So every batch job and started task has at least one execute. What do you want me to execute? As I mentioned earlier, JCL begins with a slash slash, but each JCL statement is 80 characters in length. It's mandatory to be 80 characters in length. And I'm going to talk more about this 80 characters at records and some of these records when we talk about data sets. <clears throat> so JCL is used to assign a name, and that name has an authority level associated with it because there's usually a security package that looks at that and says, ah, here's your authority. If you submit it, it takes on the authority of your ID. So then JCL is used to assign resources. I need a program. I need some data. So JCL can be viewed as a list of statements to be submitted for background batch processing or started for foreground processing. Just uh, repeating some of those things over again. Here's an example of JCL. <coughs> So in this case, it's a batch job, and we have slash slash my job with the reserved word job, 
And then you can go slash slash, do a couple spaces and say execute program equal IFER 14, which is a dummy program. This would work. You could submit it and it would run. My job is what you called it and you said I want you to find program IFER 14. So you can also, in this thing, this is the same JCL. <coughs> However, notice that I put a step one here before the execute. Why? Because it is possible one JCL stream that's a, that's a batch job right here can have multiple execute statements. Each execute statement can be identified with a different step number. Why do you want to do that? There are reasons for a statement override that you want to use step names for every execute. So to repeat myself, one job, JCL job, can have many executes. It can have one or many. Now here's an example of this job going into the JES reader and it's loading the IFBR 14 program and then what it does, it actually does write some information to the JEZ spool. And I'll be, ex I'll be uh, explaining that a little bit later. Now here's another example where I'm executing a job, but the program I'm executing is program sort. These here that follow the execute program sort, these are DD statements. Data definition is what it stands for, DD statements. So program sort, inside of program sort, it's looking for some things. So program sort is looking for sort in. It's looking for sort out because that program, the way it's written, inside there is sort in, hard coded. Sort out is hard coded. It's also looking for system input, sys in. So these are the DD names. And then the real resource is right here, the parameters. So the sort, if sort says, I need sort in. The data definition, where can I physically find it? <coughs> That's what, what's after the DD statement is the physical resource. So the above JCO has four DD names. Sort in, sort out, sys in, sys out. Oh, in fact, that's a mistake there. It says it's four, but then I only listed three. But there's four. One, two, three, four. Now, here's an example of this JCL going in. The program's loaded, which is program sort. Now, the data, we didn't, we didn't put any, we didn't put any information for data there. Notice I have sort in. And the sort in, I didn't say where we're getting it from. But what I did point out here is in six. Notice we have a sys out. DD sys out equal asterisk. Well, that's a special uh, reserved word in the DD parameter. It says write it to the JES pool. So sys out is going to go to the JES pool. So here's where I talk about uh, how we relate the file names to the DD names. It's actually referred to technically as a symbolic reference. Now, don't mistake that for variable statements because there also are variable references and symbolic references in JCL. So what a symbolic reference is, is truly tying the program file name to the JCL DD name. Here's an example. Here's a program. Here's program payroll. Program payroll, pick your language, doesn't matter, there's many languages. So you open file XYZ, and I want to read file XYZ, and then close file XYZ. Well, when I go to load this program and execute, using JCL, I'm going to execute program payroll, and it wants XYZ. And I tell it, well, XYZ is really data set name, DSM equal, Division I payroll. And so it goes to disk to find Division I payroll. And that becomes the input. 
So that's the DD data definition. The reason for that is now I can run the same program and go after different physical data, like corporate.payroll. So now I don't have to change the program. So some of you that have programmed in Windows and other environment, you hard code the physical resource inside the program. Well, this is almost 50 years old. We virtualize that with JCL. This is one of the fundamental reasons JCL exists, is to virtualize the program file name to the, and virtualize it to get to any different physical resource. So the fundamental important aspect of JCL are these DD statements, data definitions, which virtualizes the file name to go after a physical resource. That's really the, some of the heart and soul of JCL. Now, what you can do, here's a data set name. These are, these are DD statements now. You can say DSN and give it a data set name. We're going to talk about data set names in the next section. And also, when you give it a data set name, you've got to give it a disposition. The dispositions are, does the data set already exist? Or do I need to create this data set as a new allocation? So there's a disposition at the start of the job. What's the disposition to start? Does it exist, or do I need to create it new? Then, what do I do with this data set when the step ends? And you can, the end, there's a different status as you can put in here. We'll look at it in a minute. Then, what if the job abnormally ends? What do I do? And so, this disposition statement is associated with a data set name. It goes on the same DD statement. However, you can also, on a DD statement, say path equal, and in quotes, put a Unix file name to either create new Unix file names or read file names. Now, I will let you know, in the same, the same JCL, the same program can deal with Unix files or MBS data sets at the same time. And so the file name inside the program, XYZ, XYZ could read from an MBS data set or a Unix file. Just as long as the program will be able to, you know, so that you can virtualize it by using MBS data sets or Unix files. Now here's, uh, here's that disposition parameter I was talking about. This is for data set names. If you want to allocate a new data set, you say disposition new. If it already exists, you might say disposition old or disposition share. What's the difference? Old get, wants an exclusive use of it. It says, if someone else is using it, I can't run because I want that exclusively. And old also says, if I get it exclusively, no one else can get to it till I'm done. Share means I will share it with others. But I will let you know that share will let you update it. But then anybody reading it, it would be a dirty read. Then at the, at the, as the, uh, when the program ends, what do I want to do with it? Do I want to keep it? Do I want to catalog it? You may not know what catalog means yet. I plan to describe what catalog means later. Well, what if it abnormally ends? Well, if it abnormally ends, I might want to delete it. I may or may not want to keep it if it abnormally ends. I may want to keep it if it ends normally, but I may want to delete it if it ends abnormally. So these are the type of things you can code on the disposition parameter of the DD statement. So the DD statement, data definition, the program opens the DD names as input, output, or both, which means it can update it. The program has the internal file name, which I've mentioned many times, that must match the JCL DD name. And then the association is done. So this is a repeat of everything that I have mentioned, so I'm going to move forward. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, what is batch processing? Well, batch goes to the background and you submit it, minimal human intervention. Um, if it ab ends, then usually someone's got to look at the ab end and, and uh, make an adjustment. What is a started task? Well, typically you start that, and it typically runs until you stop it. 
Okay, and we'll be looking at both batch and the started task throughout the week here. What is JEZ? It turns out that there was a number of people that never heard of JEZ before. It stands for Job Entry Subsystem. And when the operating system was first built many years ago, JEZ did not exist. And I'm going to be talking more about JEZ a little bit later. But JEZ actually provides us a way to have an input and an output queue and an execution queue and a way for storing all the inputs and outputs. Also, JEZ handles the following aspects of JCL processing for ZOS. It reads JCL into the operating system. It interprets the JCL. You can have a variable substitution in the JCL. That's different than a symbolic reference. You can schedule jobs for processing, and you can control job output processing. That's what JEZ provides you. So a typical action that people are doing, they determine uh, what needs to be done. Then they'll create some JCL. Reality is most people don't create JCL. They take a template of JCL or take something from somewhere else, modify it, and then they submit it. JEZ interprets the JCL, passes it to a ZOS initiator, which is the point of presence between JEZ and MVS, or ZOS. The initiator begins to do the work. So ZOS manages each step. Remember, a step is each individual execute statement. JEZ collects the output, and then it prints the output if a printer is available, or it can remain in the queue, then the user views and interprets the output. The three basic JCL statements, job, JCL reserve word, execute is a JCL reserve word, DD, JCL reserve word. Now, these are the most important JCL statements, but there's many other things you can do in JCL you can actually create a JCL procedure. And a JCL procedure uh, begins with a PROC statement, typically ends with a PROC end statement. And what you can do is you can, instead of executing a program, you can execute a PROC. Now the PROC will be expanded JCL, and inside the JCL PROC would be the execute program. Another thing that you can do with JCL is you can have include statements. You can go slash, slash, a couple spaces, include, and then it will bring JCL in. Kind of for those of you that know COBOL, like a COBOL copy book, it brings in more statements. Also, JCL can have an if-then-else logic. If this previous step worked successfully, what do I mean by step? Execute statement. If the previous execute worked, then execute this program. Else, execute a different program. Here's some JCL basic syntax. We have the job name, which is chosen by the programmer. The reserve word job is in red. The reserve word execute, it can have a step name chosen by whoever does it. Then you've got the DD data definition. And the DD name is determined by sometimes the program. A slash slash asterisk is a comment statement in JCL. A slash asterisk is considered end of data. A slash slash with nothing after it is considered end of JCL. This very rarely ever gets used. Now here's a real example. And this example is actually in the labs for lab two. It executes program sort, and then sort in, disposition share. I want data set name, uh, that ID dot JCL. And notice I've got open parentheses here, closed parentheses. So this is a partition data set. And there's a member inside of there called area code with data in it. The sort out, I want to put it on the JEZ spool. The sysout, I'm going to put on the JEZ spool. 
the SysM DD asterisk, and what DD asterisk is all about, asterisk means whatever follows, the program will understand. You can put data inside of there or control statements. In this case, it's a control statement. We want to tell sort to sort fields starting in one for a length of three, character ascending. So that's the instructions to the sort program to sort this data. Now, here's an example of a JCL procedure. If I were to give it this, if I were to code it just like this, and I say my proc with a proc statement, here's the program sort, and notice what I did here, sort in, the DSN is ampersand sort DSN, a variable. And I say proc n. I could submit this, and the system would look at it and do nothing, because I never said to execute the proc. This by itself would do nothing. But it's an example of a JCL procedure. Now here is a J, here's the same JCL procedure, proc, proc end, but then I say execute my proc. My proc, this is considered an in-stream procedure. The reason I say in-stream is because it's all part of maybe a same data set, and it's a stream of statements. So this proc is in-stream. I say execute my proc, and oh, by the way, sort DSN, substitute that with this data set name, that member name, and oh, by the way, here's a DD asterisk. I want you to sort those fields. So when I say execute my proc, it will expand it and include that. Now, I will tell you and repeat, that's in-stream. Most of the time, people don't execute in-stream procs. There's actually a procedure library and multiple of them. So you can execute my proc, and it will go search through the procedure libraries for my proc. So that's non-in-stream. And many times, uh, that's what people do. They have procs that they execute. Oh, I forgot to use this pointer. I should do more of this. Um, here's a JCL procedure. And the procedure is my proc. I'm going to execute my proc. Here's the variable substitution sort DSN. But this time, this is called a proc statement override. In the case of sort out, in the proc, sort out is going to, by default, going to the JES pool. Well, I don't want sort out to go to the JES pool. I want sort out to go to a data set. So what I can do, execute my proc, and then you can code this, my sort dot sort out. My sort is the step name. Step name is associated with an execute. And inside that step, you should find a DD name called sort out. Dot sort out, it's right here. I want to override the DD statement. I want the data set name to be this. I want the disposition, it's brand new data set. I want you to catalog it, and I'll explain that later. I'm going to give it some space on disk, and I'm going to tell you which disk volume to place it on. I will explain more about that uh, physical allocation a little bit later. But this is known as a JCL proc statement override. So you can have many procs, but that doesn't mean you're hard-coded into what that proc does. You can override the statements. Another thing that I want to talk about in JCL is continuation and concatenation. So I mentioned that JCL, the limitations of JCL is an 80-column record. Well, what if I have a statement a DD statement that goes beyond 80. Well, you can continue a DD statement or any JCL statement, and continuation 
basically allows a JCL statement to, to span multiple records. And the way that's done is with a comma. We actually have an example of that previously. This DD statement has a data set name, a disposition, and notice here how I placed a comma there, and then a space, then a slash slash, at least one space, and this is a continuation. That was an example of continuation. Now, I want to talk about something called concatenation. So concatenation allows a single DD name to have multiple DD statements. We're going to look at an example of that. Oh, by the way, another example of continuation, comma, space, slash, slash, space. This could easily be on one statement. Job 1, comma, region equal 8M, comma, notify I equal IBM user, or I could continue it. Now, this is an example of concatenation. So a program might be reading data in. And so I can say, DD, disposition old, the data set name is my.input1. So it would begin to read my.input1, but on the last record of my.input1, it's not done. It immediately starts reading from my.input2. At the end of that, it immediately reads your dot data, data set name. So it treats it like it's one file. Notice it's got a DD, it's got data in as a DD name, and then it's followed by subsequent DD statements with no DD name. That's concatenation. So this data in is associated with all that data. That is concatenation in JCL. There's many, many util system utilities that can be executed, and I'm not going to get into all of them right now. But many times, as you know as programmers, don't write something that already exists. If a utility will do the job, let a utility do the job. Don't write a program. So, for example, many people don't write sort utility. They have one that they execute. Um, also, when you logged on to TSO, you actually executed a program. And by the way, one of the things you can do is run TSO in batch. And a lot of people do that for a lot of different reasons. And I'll be talking about some of these system utilities a little bit later. But ZOS environment has many, many system utilities that come in the base. So there's a JCL user's guide. There's a JCL reference. And let me explain right now the difference between a guide and a reference, because you'll actually see that terminology with multiple books in multiple disciplines. A reference is organized by syntax. A guide is typically organized by concepts and explains things a little bit more. And so you'll see that later on, many of the different things I talk about will have a guide and it will have a reference. Remember, references are organized by syntax. Guides, many times, are organized by concepts. Where can you find all the utilities? There actually is something called DFSMS that I'm going to talk about later. It's a base component. And there's actually a manual called DFSMS DFP Utilities. It has many of the system utilities. Not all, but many. There's also a ZOS Concepts a reusable JCL collection, and unfortunately, in the PDF, these are hyperlinks, but I do plan to look at all of these right now, uh, well, not at the very moment. I plan to look at these at the end of this session. We'll look at the user's guide, the reference, the utilities, and I want to show you the ZOS Concepts reusable JCL collection. Another thing that I always uh, inform people about, if you've never seen JCL before, an excellent source of information is Wikipedia. We put all of our technology out on Wikipedia, 
and they try to make it very digestible. So you can go to Wikipedia and look for job control language and get an overview of JCL from there. So now you understand the purpose of JCL. And once again, you understand the uh, basic statements, job, execute, and DD, and you understand the relationship between the program file name to the JCL DD name. It's a level of virtualization. You want to be able to locate the JCL professional manuals, documentation, and online help. That's what I plan to do right now. So I'm going to screen share, and we're going to go look at that. Let me know when you can see my screen. Okay. So what I plan to do is how I plan to get to these. I'm going to go to the PowerPoint documentation. So we've got the hyperlinks in there. This is the session we looked at yesterday. Here is this URL for the bookshelf. Remember also, if I do a Google search on IBM manuals, the first hit is this one. Now, what I plan to do is go to the different shelves. Things are organized differently, and people like to navigate this. I see a lot of people navigating in a lot of different ways. What I prefer to do, though, sometimes I like to go to this download documentation and get the PDFs because it's faster. Here's the shelves. Remember, an element. Element is the base component comes with the operating system. Features are optional components. But then you have all these shells. Oh, don't have a cur you actually, you're looking at my real cursor. Here are the shells. But then in the MVS, the ZOS MVS shelf, right here, ZOS MVS, you'll find the JCL manuals in here. So we should find the JCL User guide and the JCL reference. Thank you. It's uh, right here. So let's look at the JCL reference. The JCL reference is organized by syntax. Well, let's go look at the DD statement because that is the, the most function-rich statement. So if I want to look at the DD statement, it's in Chapter 12. Let's go there, and it's going to start explaining the DD statement, and then what it should do is give me things I can code. But this one's really function-rich. A lot of things you can do. See, there's a DD asterisk. You can go DD dummy. It's like the dev null. Then you can, uh, there's lots of parameters that you can put on it. But there's some basic ones. So they've got it organized by syntax starting with this AMP, uh, but then there's going to be one for data set name, DSM. So this is organized by syntax. Now, one other thing that I want to show you is that the utilities, there is a different bookshelf. And I'll be talking about this later. There's another bookshelf called DFSMS. It's all about data. ZOS, DFMS. DFSMS, and I'll be talking more about this as I mentioned. This is about data on disk and utilities of getting, doing, dealing with the data on disk. So in the DFSMS bookshelf is actually a large amount of information. Now, right here is the DFSMS DFP utilities. This is where you find some of the standard utilities. And let me get that table of content again. There we go. So IED copy. And there will be different chapters on some of the different utilities. Is this all the utilities? No, it's not. But it's some of the, the basic ones. See, I'm having a little bit of a problem navigating this new PDF release. There's IED copy, IED compare. IEB Jenner, IEB DG test 
data generator. So you got the idea. Now there's lots of, uh, there's another thing that I like to show people. Oh, there's the URL right there. Okay, so let me go here. This is considered an info center, and this is the Z concepts, and look how this is organized. But even down here, there's little 30 minute courses, and then there's this thing called reusable JCL collection. So if we look at that, there's examples of JCL creating a data set. If I double click on that, here's a JCL example of creating a data set. You can use a dummy program, IFBR 14, to create the data set. Okay, so this is um, JCL.